this one is about a couple of key learnings that we've uh, gathered from um, over 200 implementations of Trendminer now. 200 implementations, with that I mean kind of onboardings and, and trajectories. Um, some will be very, let's say, high level, geared more towards leadership positions and how they can influence behavior, how they can actually be um, kind of the change agents, so more on a high level. Some of them are more specific to users and how they can actually be catalysts of that change, how they can actually accelerate some of those things by word of mouth and by, uh, by sharing their uh, innovations. Before we go through those five key learnings, I'm going to talk a little bit about management of change. Not much, but just a, a couple of basics, a couple of things we noticed, and then five key learnings of, of how certain companies that are actually very successful have tackled those issues or have tackled those, uh, those challenges. And then at the end, we'll have, uh, uh, you have the opportunity to ask some uh, questions. If you look at change in an organization or innovation in an organization, as the quote says here, it's typically less about brand new ideas. You have to realize them. You have to actually implement changes to, to prevent that from happening. And that's why this quote is about, you know, you have to make those ideas a reality because that's what it's all about. We can philosophize and we can, we can have all these great ideas, but if we never put them into practice, they're just that, they're just ideas. If we look at the users or the, 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 the people that give Trendminer a try, I think we can split them up in a few categories. And in every onboarding or in every engagement or every touch point we have, we're gonna have those, those techies, the people that really like to adopt new technology and, and really look for the boundaries of those tools. And the early adopters that really want to, you know, keep up with recent trends, keep up with modern tools, those we will have no problem of converting or we will have no problem of um, getting, um, let's say, getting uh, addicted to uh, Trendminer. Um, there's going to be other people as well, and that's not a knock on those people, but some people just have it so busy that they want to see results first. They want to see, well, I just I, I want to see my colleagues actually do this because, okay, demo might be nice, but I want to see some successes in my own company first before I actually convert. And the more we go to the right, we're going to have more skeptic people, and there might be even more one category beyond that is the people that were never convinced, right? There's always going to be people that, uh, you know, are just set in their ways and that's fine, but those will be very hard to convince to, uh, to give new things a try. In reality, we've seen that that gap is actually a little bit bigger. <laughs> so we're going to have, let's say, hypothetically, we'll onboard 10 users or we'll give 10 uh, new people access to Trendminer specifically or any type of new tool in general. Two or three of them are just going to run with it and they're just going to be, you know, right away asking us questions like, hey, I want to do this, I want to do that, and they'll fill up our box of uh, feature ideas. Um, it's going to take a little bit longer, it's going to be a little bit harder, and the gap is quite a bit wider to also get those, uh, those more conservative or pragmatist people to, uh, to convert as well. Now, what can we do to make that gap as small as possible? Because don't get me wrong, that gap will be there. It's always going to be there, but how can we make that gap as small as possible? What are some of the things we can do to, uh, to uh, accommodate that? Basically, there's three essential building blocks, management, people, and technology. Technology, pretty clear if you're running on uh, an, an, a somewhat older data infrastructure or you're having network latency problems or you're going to have uh, maybe some slow hard disks or whatever the case may be, obviously, you know, if the user experience is not good, instead of three people, we might only convert one because it's just so hard to work with that tool. So technology definitely is a piece of it, but I think everybody understands that. So we're not going to go into that. We're going to focus more on some of the, uh, on the, of the other two blocks in this, uh, in this diagram. All right, key learning number one. When you get started or when you want to convince new people, convince other people to, uh, uh, to try something new, try to identify very clear goals. Okay, that's very, very important. Ideally, those goals are also tied to some kind of uh, vision, either short, mid, or long term. Um, why is that? Because if we go into an onboarding and we're asking people, um, hey, bring some use cases to the table, what are the things you would like to work on? And they can't really come up with any, it's a huge red flag for us. Because first of all, that means that um, maybe they're not ready for trend minor, maybe some other things need to happen first. But what I can also mean is that they've just been randomly chosen to sit in on onboarding. They have no idea what they're coming to do. 
they have no idea what the goal is of this training and they might not uh, know how this fits into a bigger picture for uh, the company itself. So try to really align use cases with some of the goals that you have. And I think Thomas gave a perfect example. You have this line that's sold out. You want to improve the, uh, the, the throughput of that whole line. One-on-one -on -one match with, I think, the corporate vision or the corporate goal in that case to, uh, to improve that situation. For example, hypothetic company, um, they really want to uh, achieve three things during a pilot or during a rollout of Trendminer. First one is to quantify the benefits of Trendminer, the ROI. I'm going to go more in specifics later. Um, they want to have a good idea of, okay, what, are what is the co total cost structure? And they also want to investigate or validate how Trendminer fits into the existing tooling landscape that they already have. Those could be three example goals. That really helps us as Trendminer being your partner um, and us as a customer success team also to be more specific. We know what you are looking for. We know in what ways we can potentially help you, what content might be relevant for you. So it's not even only on, on, the, on the customer side that it's helpful. It's also helpful on our side because we are very more, much more targeted to do the things that are um, valuable to you. So for example, one company wanted to focus specifically on energy consumption. Okay? They wanted to get a grasp on okay, how much specific energy per pound of finished product are we spending and how can we drive that down? Because that was a huge uh, cost center for them. First thing that fits into that, uh, into that area is okay, let's make the calculations we have across our plants, let's make those consistent. Because every, every um, uh, plant was maybe reporting somewhat differently or maybe using a couple of different rules. So first of all, and this is really low, low trash or, or um, let's say low hanging fruit, let's just make those calculations more consistent. Then as there were different operation types, <coughs> let's make sure we benchmark per product type or produ per operation type. So it, it doesn't make sense if one, if one of the plants is 60% of the time producing product A and 40% another product and another side is doing this just to reverse, it doesn't make sense to compare those because it's going to uh, skew the results. So make sure that we benchmark correctly. Then they wanted to create monitors based on that specific, use, uh, specific energy consumption, uh, automatically label those for further investigation. And then as a final step, if there's time left during that onboarding, let's do root cause analysis of some of those historical excursions. Sometimes we want to we jump right ahead to the fourth topic. We, we want to do root cause analysis. But we're missing then, when we do that, we're missing the bigger picture. We're missing all those other things that are actually more on the, on the, on the easier side to accomplish, but that sometimes get forgotten. In this case, because they were the, that goal was so clear, we could basically split up almost structure our days. We're going to work on this first, on this next, and uh, be have a very productive, uh, very productive. Another example is, um, uh, a customer I worked with personally. So they were using critical, uh, or, or some of the critical measurements were uh, uh, measured redundantly, so they had redundant sensors. Um, and as a very first case we wanted to work on, let's just grab one event of that type, and let's just investigate. Let's see what we can do. Let's see what kind of information is here in the data. And it was pretty interesting because you could see it with the naked eye kind of when uh, deviations started happening. But typically that was too late, right? You would be getting too short or too close to the actual uh, uh, pump trip, and that pump trip was then uh, sometimes linked to a plant shutdown. In the end, we were able to detect that on one data set about 15 to 30 days before that shutdown. Next step, so really in stepwise uh, approach, we validated those results with the team. We wanted to make sure that everybody was on board with what we were doing. We validated on five to 10 more uh, cases because there was a little bit of skepticism. So we said, okay, let's, in, before we go roll out this to all sensors, let's do a little subset first. Validated those results, again, brought them back to the team. And once everybody was on the same page, we then decided to roll it out to uh, about 500 of those pairs. And on every step of the way, because the goal was so clear, everybody was buying in and was knowing what was expected and what we were doing. There's other examples. This is a slide from, uh, from DSM that they used, I think, in one of our webinars, uh, where specifically a continuous improvement slash Six Sigma group was investigating how, uh, how Trendminer could be used more effectively in, uh, in, in the way they were doing things. So one of the areas of focus was Six Sigma projects. Okay, what can, on, and what areas is, is Trendminer useful there? And by getting that experience, they also identified some other areas like root cause analysis in specific cases or, or just general troubleshooting that Trendminer was also able to, uh, to actually attribute or contribute to some of those uh, value drivers, capacity increase being one of them. This is a bit of a, an example related to that. So 
typically what works very well is if you have a problem that you've already solved, right? You've tackled a problem using your existing tooling, whatever that may be, um, and you kind of subject Trendmire to a test. Could we have gotten to the same result? And if so, would it have been faster or more efficient or would it have been uh, easier to get to that point? And in this case, um, they were doing the analyze phase of the demaic cycle. And what they had done before in about two weeks with several people, so quite from, from a cost perspective quite high, they were able to do now in about two afternoons. And if you can get such an example, and it was, it was you know, very, very specific, like we're not going to tackle any other case, we're just going to have a goal here to redo this case that we did, or this analysis we did for uh, Six Sigma, we're going to redo it. Everybody knows what expected, everybody knows what you're looking for, and that way, um, again, you can get a lot of buy-in from, uh, from such an example. And of course, if you can get results like this, this is going to spread like, uh, like a wildfire and more people are going to give this a try. Because that actually takes me to the second key learning, which is start small to grow fast. Right? Um, what we see sometimes is that in all of their enthusiasm, users want to tackle every problem at once. And we do a little bit of everything, but we don't do everything of, of one specific thing. Similarly, in terms of selecting how you start and in, in selecting, okay, how many people are we going to involve in this first step, or how we're going to validate this in our process. It's typically good to start with a somewhat smaller group of key users. And ideally, those key users have selected themselves, so have kind of uh, uh, voted themselves into the project. And that way, you can do a couple of things, or you can achieve a couple of things. You can learn from your successes, but also from your failures in, let's say, a pilot phase or, or an, an exploration phase before you open it up to everyone. Those failures, strong word, can be a number of things, but it can also be very small things. For example, you will notice that some data from the, from, from the historian server is not coming in at the right resolution, or the default resolution of Trendminer, which is one minute, is not sufficient for some problems. You can tackle all those things before you actually involve more people, and those changes are harder to make. Um, similarly, you can uh, figure certain things out, like how do I uh, enable users to log in as easy as possible with their smart cards or with their uh, Windows logins before you roll it out to everyone and before those changes are harder to make. We've geared our onboarding approach uh, specifically to uh, accommodate that. What we'll do first, the example that Thomas gave, uh, we're going to basically lock ourselves up in a room, one of our experts with those selected uh, key users, and we're going to really focus on those goals that ideally have been defined before and try to get as much out of those few days that we can in terms of tangible results, in terms of ideas that, can, that need some follow-up, in terms of, for example, context hub or dash hub uh, uh, setups that we can leave for other people to use before we actually open it up to, uh, to, to more users where we take more of a training approach. So in the beginning, we're more the expert and we really are hands-on. Next or the next phase, we take a little bit of a step back. We try to use what's been established in the company as, uh, as, as that fuel to the fire that hopefully keeps on, uh, keeps on burning. Similarly, yeah, this goes into uh, quite a bit of detail, but similarly, when we go or we work with global companies, we start off with <laughs> smaller pilots, try to validate what we're looking for, see if those goals are actually, because ideally the goals that you set, because they're linked to a corporate vision, they're also applicable to other sites, to other plans. We can just not copy-paste, but at least we can take the safe concepts over. Um, and then, of course, in the end, try and get to an enterprise type situation where there's an internal community of coaches, of trainers, uh, and that we can really focus on best practices. But start small first. Don't try to run before you can, uh, before you can walk. A couple of examples here where, um, where Total uh, was, um, was basically piloting first just in Antwerp. From there, extended to a couple more sites until there was some central interest being generated. Um, all those steps were taken to find those reference use cases, to find those early successes, and then it was decided to roll out. And of course, um, those lessons that we learned, like tying to corporate vision, those are, are uh, still, uh, still important. Number three, identify the right key users. Ideally, the right key users are the people that have um, or are interested in modern technologies or in like trying to challenge themselves. Can I do what I've been doing so far? Can I step outside of my comfort zone? And can I try to do this in a new way? And I'll know that I can, it's possible that I'll stumble at first. Maybe what I would do before in 15 minutes, maybe the first time I try it is going to take me an hour. That's not going to frustrate me. I'm just going to keep on pushing. 
those are kind of the, the, the traits and, and the not even it doesn't even have to do anything with technical skills. This really has to do with, uh, with the mentality and the approach that people want to take. Try to really look for those people. Try to see who <laughs> wants to uh, put up his uh, kind of put up his head in the wind and is not afraid to uh, to fail maybe at first, but wants to take that next step. Once you've been able to find the right key users, and um, if you're interested in, in what we think is the right key user, we have a bit of a profile uh, written down, so we can share that if, if you're interested. Um, next step would be to find coaches on every plant. What do coaches do? They are actually the local change agents. They are the people that um, you know, are open for questions from their colleagues and are open to share what they've learned with other people to enable them to get to the same place, right? And that takes some patience, that takes some maybe even frustration, uh, but it also takes a bit of a knowledge of how do, people, um, how do people deal with change, what are the things I need to do in terms of goal setting, communication, uh, what can I put in place to uh, really enable people, and to do so at scale, because we can't expect coaches also to do everything one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, there's certainly a place for one-on-one -on -one activities, but we can't expect coaches to do everything one-on-one, -on -one, so that's, uh, that's another thing to think about. And if you're really part of a global company, having some kind of central steering committee that uh, uh, keeps, keeps the overview, sees the high level picture, that maybe can translate success in Asia Pacific to something that is applicable in North America or the wet other way around, um, can be uh, 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 ideal. And we have a few companies that operate on a global level. I can't go into the structure or the, or the way they thought about this process and the way they implemented their uh, steering committee. But if you're interested in that, you know where to find me. So we can definitely discuss that in more detail and see maybe if some of those concepts or some of those structures could be, uh, could be uh, applicable to you uh, or to your company as well. So here we have that, uh, that, that profile that we talked about. So that willingness to change, that willingness to improve and to share insights. Uh, backed by solid, solid process knowledge, because that is important. Uh, I think the, the best way to lose a user is to have somebody come in and, and give a training as if he's the expert. But as soon as a question comes in about, hey, but what does that mean for a heat exchanger? Or what does that mean for my distillation column? You're basically out of answers. That's the best way to, uh, uh, I would say, to lose a user. <laughs> so uh, th those are uh, important traits. Right, this is a little bit more in, into the trend matter coach um, um, aspect of things. All right, um, one example of what such a structure could look like. So we have that steering committee that's kind of overarching, that defines priorities, that shares best practices, that is also responsible for quantifying results. Because I know we're all engineers and we're all pretty hyped when we can solve a problem, but we're not necessarily taking that next step in, in terms of, okay, how do I translate that now to a dollar amount or a percentage amount. Like, I mean, the, the hard work is done for us and we rather move on to something new, something new technically, rather than like finish this part up, which is diffi definitely important. Um, under that steering committee, you can have a coaching program. So have a few coaches in place, um, have consistent training opportunities because obviously companies have turnover or people get promoted. People uh, take on new assignments. Maybe they move like I did from, from Belgium to, to the US. And there's always going to be a knowledge gap that's, that gets left behind. So how do we deal with that? How do we make sure that new people that are coming into our company, how do we make sure that they can, they can learn from what's been left behind by others and get to that same level quickly? Now, for example, as Trendminer, we do something what is called VILTs, or Virtual Instructor-Led Trainings. We try to do those every quarter. So every quarter, we'll basically put a camera in our office, and we'll have one of us uh, stand in front of it for an hour and explain a little bit about Trendminer, and we'll talk from the basics to the more advanced uh, stuff. We try to do that quarterly, and we try to invite people to join that. But of course, you know, if I send out an email, it gets lost in spam, or people are like, well, I mean, I've heard enough from those Trendminer guys. I'm going to skip this for now. Uh, it's not always possible for us to reach those people. So as a company, it's something to think about. about OK, how do, we, uh, how do we deal with this problem? Another problem is, if you've been using Trendminer for two, two or three years, uh, three years ago is when, uh, when I joined, more, more or less, the evolution of the product since then has just been uh, crazy. Uh, but it's difficult even for us to make sure that we understand all the possible applications and all these new capabilities and the, uh, the tips and tricks. So it's even harder for customers to keep up, especially because we know as an on-prem uh, solution, 
It can take a little time between, for example, our release and our release webinar. And the actual time you get access to those new features, so you know there's a bit of a gap there too. So how do we make sure we keep uh, uh, we keep uh, um, uh, on on top of that as well? So again, we try to tackle that in certain ways. But I would also suggest to uh, uh, when you're thinking about the right key users, who would be willing to take up that mantle of staying updated and actually keep the rest of the organization <coughs> updated as well? And then finally, definition of some strategic topics like okay, where do we think as a company we can gain some quick wins? And how do we uh, uh, basically look for multipliers? I like that word. One of our customers used it. Um, where are the multipliers in my company? Where can I, for example, uh, uh, these guys, they had to travel to China, North America, uh, uh, South America for some specific predefined project, right? It, it had nothing to do with Trendminer. But every time they would touch the ground on a new site or a new plant, they would just say, hey, OK, we've been looking at this other problem now for two or three days. Let's just take one hour because I have something to show you. And then you would go through a quick demo of Trendminer. Very low cost, very quick way to actually spread the word and get way more people uh, interested and involved than, uh, than uh, would otherwise have been possible. Kilonia number four, one of my favorites, communication. How do I make sure that people buy in from the beginning? How do we make sure that people keep on buying in throughout, uh, throughout the, 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 the months and years that Trendminer is available. Well, the first one I think is easy to understand throughout a pilot. Our pilots are typically about six months long. Um, communication throughout that project, that's kind of easy to define, like, okay, guys, we're getting this new tool. These are the steps we're gonna take. And we have, as I mentioned, we have that onboarding program that we've standardized. So that's, that's quite easy to, to, uh, to communicate. But it's actually the little things sometimes that make the difference. And I have an example of that later. Um, Second one is, okay, how do I work around a structured communication plan? I mean, we've been talking direct during the coaching program about a community. How do I establish a community inside of my company? And how do I, by using a communication plan, uh, support that effort? These are kind of the line items that we can do as a start, at least, to make sure we, can, we, we keep communicating over a 12-month period. So at the start of the project, when we involve the key users, Make sure we've communicated the vision, the goals that we're after. Um, make sure that people understand what their role is in an onboarding. Like, for example, why are certain people in the hands-on session and why are other people in the training? Make sure that's understood. And then after every milestone, make sure that the results are shared, uh, making sure that, you know, um, for example, feature IDs that have been shared with Trendminer, if we implement one of those, make sure that the right people, we try to do that, but typically it's way stronger when that comes from, uh, from within. So let's say you've identified one key point as an improvement. Three to four months later, no pressure, Thomas, maybe a little bit longer, uh, that gets into the product. Let's make sure those people are kept in the loop. Right? So those are the things to, uh, to, really, to really think about. Other things you can do is, for example, in a monthly newsletter, or if you have some kind of uh, SharePoint or internal uh, system where you can easily, like a Microsoft Teams where you can share things, just once a month, a short update, nothing more, can be super powerful. This is one example of what I mentioned before, how the little things can make a difference. This was the invite to a training session. You can see it's not a very extensive invite, it's just two sentences. But this, is this guy is saying, hey, we're having this Trendminer training coming up. This is what I've been able to achieve within I think he said uh, um, within five to 10 minutes, just a little teaser. I was looking at a particular ramp up and using the similarity search, I can immediately find something that looks similar, overlay it, compare, uh, and that was it. And that really piqued interest, kind of a mystery, like how did he do this? How was this possible? How can I learn this myself? This little aspect of mystery uh, really got people interested and got them uh, engaged to start that training. Um, we have other things in place like, uh, like how-to series, uh, that we send out after onboardings. Um, one of the new features or one of the new big things in our uh, R3 release and that we keep on building now is to have in-application onboarding. So based on, uh, let's say you've been using Trendminer for a while, we implemented a new feature that otherwise would have been hidden somewhere. We really want to point you towards that and show you some examples, work it, walk you through the workflow and how that could be applied, uh, uh, things like that, or things of that nature. Another um, Interesting thing, I think, is a couple of customers have set up uh, really SharePoint locations, hubs. SharePoint is one example, can be anything. Uh, I use our example for customer success documents, which is something we are working on. Like, 
building a central place where our users can come and download always the latest information and documentation. You can do similar things internally, for example, publishing onboarding uh, reports, or if you've done something interesting, make a little blog post and put that on somewhere that people can easily find that back. And then another example that I uh, um, um, saw at, at one of our customers and I personalized to, uh, uh, to keep it confidential, basically one portal where all the most important information could be found. So for example, a link to all of the training resources. So that's where the academy is found for Trendminer. This is where you can find uh, their support page. This is how you can log a ticket. These are the main contacts in our company. So for example, if you want to talk to Trendminer CSM, call that Frederick guy. If you want to connect to the server in APJ, this is the only button you have to click. So it's very, very low threshold for people to get started. One of the important links on here for me was, uh, I'm not entirely sure what it was, but it was like, how do I create my account? So make it easy for people to, as soon as they look up Trendminer, find something on their internet. This is how you create an account. This is the person you have to, to reach out to, and you will get that done. And then finally, that step I mentioned before, um, working towards quantified results. So, I mean, we all like being busy. We all like being uh, doing some cool searches, but we also have to keep a little bit of the focus on value. Try to quantify those ahead of time because that question will come at some point. So it's good to be, uh, it's good to be prepared. And this no doesn't always have to be in terms of uh, specific dollar amounts. So for example, creating a learning organization in itself can be uh, super invaluable. So keep that in mind as you go throughout, throughout this journey that people will be skeptic and they will, s they will say, show me the value so that you have something, uh, have, have something prepared. All right, and I can reference some of our webinars we did, for example, with SciTech where uh, they were able to quantify one of those cases to about 2 million euros. Sometimes I don't like showing this result because it sets a bit the, the, the wrong expectations. Not every case is going to be $2 million. It's, of course, nice to have one like this, but don't, don't lose track of all the small gains, the small wins you can, uh, you can, uh, you can generate as well.